Wasn't that wonderful? <laughs> Okay. Yoganandaji said that the yogi should be able to stand unshaken amidst the crash of breaking worlds. And as Swamiji was describing yesterday, we are living in a time of breaking worlds. We are living in a time of transition from Kali Yuga, which is an age where the consciousness of man on our planet is basically unenlightened. It basically understands the world only in terms of matter, of form. And we are moving into an age, Dwapara Yuga, the age of energy, where people, all of us, and we are the forefront of that, really understand that. We are harbingers of a new age. And we are starting to realize that form isn't real. What's real is the energy behind it. What's real, not, what is real is not this religion or that religion or this na nation or that nation, but the underlying, as Jyotish was saying, Master, his first talk, 1920, the science of religion, which Swamiji rewrote as God is for everyone, that very first talk s told us it doesn't matter what faith you're in. It doesn't matter what nationality, what race. Underlying it all is the movement towards happiness. And this is the, the uh, keynote of Dwapara Yuga, where people begin to say form is just not that important. But as Swami said yesterday, the problem we face now is this new energy of Dwapara Yuga is animating the old forms of Kali Yuga. And so dogmatism and uh, materialism and greed and all these things are, be are becoming stronger and they're clashing, they're clashing with the new energy. So I remember early on when I began reading about the change of ages, I thought, oh great, we're not in Kali Yuga anymore, we're in this new age. And then the more I read about this new age, I, I thought, you know, this isn't such a good thing, this new age we're in, because it's a turbulent time. It's a time of chaos and violence and conflict. And what we need to learn how to do is to understand that time and to make use of that energy because Dwapara Yuga is, in many ways, it's the best time for a yogi to be born. Because we know this world very clearly isn't our home. If we were born in Satya Yuga, we would be totally, it would be just like, ah, here we are at last. Mm -hmm. But this world Dwapara Yuga, of Dwapara Yuga is uncomfortable. <coughs> and I love that one line from, uh, one of Swami's songs where God is saying to the devotee, oh my saint awake, come find my love, your true home. Well, God's love is not very prevalent in this world today. And our true home is elusive, but we need to understand that we have chosen, we have chosen these times. Yoganandaji was a warrior. He was of the Kshatriya race. I remember Swamiji said yesterday one of the most oft quoted lines from the Bhagavad Gita. And by the way, if you don't know, I think everyone must, but Swami has just completed doing 108 10 minute discourses on Master's commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita, which are being posted periodically on YouTube. And within two weeks, uh, it's almost 5,000 views of these things. So it's, it's just extraordinary. But <clears throat> one of the most oft quoted passages from the Gita, and Swami quoted it yesterday, whenever virtue declines and vices predominate, I will incarnate again as an avatar taking physical form to destroy evil and reestablish virtue. And you look back over the history of the ages, it's so interesting because the Bhagavad Gita and this battlefield of Kurukshetra that upon which this battle took place. The key players of the Bhagavad Gita in that battle were Krishna and Arjuna. And that, and Master tells us that reincarnated in our time, Arjuna 
was is master and Babaji Krishna is it's so it's the same these line of gurus they reincarnate again and again when vice is ascendant and virtue is suppressed and so here we are in this world that feels not too comfortable but we need to understand how to use this energy of dwapara yuga which is not easy, which is not harmonious, which is not without conflict and war and misunderstanding. So interesting, wasn't it, the recent elections? Uh, I'm interesting, I can say, but heartbreaking in Iran where there was all the, the brutality and the corruption, but it was captured on people's videos and cell phones and the world could see it. And this, in a way, encapsulates the times in which we're living because there's a new energy coming, and that which is of the old energy, it's still strong, but it can't hide anymore. It's coming out into the open. The fallacies, the wrong thinking of separatism and division, and we need to help this happen. We need to use the energy of our times to, for our own spiritual growth and for the transformation of the planet. I always love this image. Uh, you see it in uh, theories of space propulsion and in uh, science fiction movies where a rocket is having to travel to a very distant planet, but it doesn't have on its own power with its own fuel supply, it doesn't have enough energy. So the brilliant little engineers in the room said, we'll use the gravity of that big, of Saturn or Mars or whatever it is to propel us around and shoot us forward into space. So they, sh they move just outside of a borderline of the gravity of Saturn, and they spin around it, and then they use that energy to shoot off farther into space. Well, that's what we need to do. We need to use this energy of Dwapara Yuga, which is like a great big sail on a boat, but no rudder. And so we're, we're moving. It's like that joke, the, the engineer comes to the captain. He said, Captain, I have good news and bad news. We're making very good time. We're ahead of schedule. But the bad news is we're lost. <laughs> and that's sort of where we find ourselves. We're really doing things fast, but we have no idea where we're going. So we can use that propulsion, the energy of the times in which we live, but then we need, if, if all it is is chaotic energy, we won't be able to make the kind of spiritual progress we want. So then, to use that energy, we look to our line of gurus, to Master, who came at this time. Swamiji has said, and it is become increasingly clear, Yogananda is the avatar of Dwapara Yuga, because all of his teachings are based on the principles of energy. Swamiji said that even this fantastic commentary, we just had a, a, a week-long course on Master's Commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita. If you have not studied Swamiji's Essence of the Bhagavad Gita, read it and watch his 10-minute clips. The way Master described the, and gave us the insight into what the Gita is really about, it's it is unparalleled. It is unique in Dwapara Yuga. We have a friend who lives in our ashram in Gargan, and she said as a young girl, she's an Indian woman, she said, I grew up with the Gita, but I, I kept trying to understand it, and I trying to understand it, and I never could. And then finally, she said, when I read Swami's commentaries, I wept, because the, for the first time I could understand what the Gita was about. And it's life-changing. And Swamiji said, this interpretation could not have come in Kali Yuga. It had to wait to Dwapara Yuga because it explains the reality behind the forms, the, rea the symbolism, the universal battle that each one of us faces between our higher nature and our lower nature. And so the guru, it, it, particularly Yogananda, is the guide in this chaotic, violent, confusing time of Dwapara Yuga. We were watching recently the Tour de France on the great bike race uh, throughout the French countryside. And they have the professional bicyclists 
form the Peloton, and they have the lead writer, and they take turns because the lead writer is the one who creates the stream, and then the others are all pulled along behind it, and they don't have to face the resistance of the wind against them. And so that's what the guru is. That's what master is in this age. He's the head of the Peloton. He's saying, my children, my disciples, my sincere followers, I'm going to cut through the chaos of Dwapara Yuga. You just follow behind me and ride on the wave of divine consciousness that I'm creating. And this is what we can do because all of master's techniques, you know, think about it. He said, it's so fascinating, that the energization exercises which help us to recharge our body, you all know them, You're, if you haven't, I know you'll learn them this week. He said this was his unique contribution to the science of yoga, unique. He said yoga is vast and ancient. Its techniques are without number, but the energization exercises are our gift. And Master said, if all you had were the energization exercises, you could discover all the other techniques of meditation and even of Kriya Yoga. So Master brought us the energization exercises. He brought us the techniques of concentrating our mind. And, and Supreme, of course, as Jyotish was describing, Kriya Yoga, which helps us through the agency of our willpower and our conscious, sensitive awareness of the energy within us to draw that energy up to higher centers of awareness. So what Yogananda brought in this age is showing us, yes, we are swimming in a sea of chaos, but I will show you how to use that energy for your own propulsion forward past the limitation of this age. So why is it important now that we have heightened energy? Why do we need it? Well, for one thing, yeah, Giovanni just answered the question, so, oh, yeah, what's the kind of question of that? Why do we need more energy? Well, for many reasons in this age in which we live. We, as Swami was alluding to yesterday, there may be troubled times ahead. We are floating on ruffled waters. And with increased energy, with clarity, with our center strongly within ourselves, whatever happens, we can deal with it. Ananda has had, we've had so many experiences. And, you know, some of my most thrilling memories are watching members, my brothers and sisters and friends of the Ananda community, go through the most difficult of times with calmness, with strength, with even-mindedness, standing unshaken amidst the crash of breaking worlds. It can be done. And without heightened energy, it was so interesting during the fire, 1976, when this whole community was burnt down to the ground. And just watching the different play of the people here, some people said, my house burned down, where's my money? What about me? They contracted in on themselves, they imploded. I have needs. Other people just thought, what can I do to help others? Gee, I have a little food, I'll give it to this person. They have a couple of children. Other people went immediately into how do we rebuild? And so you saw the whole spectrum. People with all having the same outward experience. Some people left, they said, oh, this is too much. I can't deal with this. This, my, the world as I know it has been destroyed. I'm out of here. And other people, I remember in that moment, just standing there amidst the ashes and looking, I happened to be with Jyotish and Seva at the moment. And I just said, where are we going to rebuild the community? And they just looked at me with absolute calm, absolute, absolute clarity. And they said, what do you mean? We're going to rebuild right here. And there was not a doubt in their mind because of that centered energy. So in the times ahead, whatever happens, you make master your pole star. He can take everything away from you. I've lived through that. I've lost everything I had multiple times as part of Ananda. And here I am. I'm, I, I remember that day of the fire. It was all taken away the next day. Uh, a few days later, there was a knock on the door, and it was the Red Cross, and they said, here's an unlimited voucher. Buy whatever you need. And my husband, who is a, a hermit at heart, 
he just looked and he said, oh, I think we can rebuild, we can repurchase everything for about $300. And I looked at him and I said, $300 for everything we own? And, and I just took it as a challenge. I said, well, let's see if we can. And we did. And, you know, it was just that thrill of watching your own strength come to the fore. But that strength has to be honed, sow the seeds of success in the season of failure. And then when the, you need them, there they will be. And so, one, because of world karma that we will be moving into. Two, because of individual karma. We, as we were saying, we need to if we want to burn up our karma and be free, this is no easy task. This takes everything you've got. And I, uh, recently I've been going through this experiment because whenever Swamiji comes, and I want you to know, this is in case you haven't caught on yet, it is no easy matter when Swami comes. Everything's, oh, this is wonderful and blissful concerts. Every single person in the community that I've been talking to said, oh my God. <laughs> Because he heightens the energy and he, he sucks out all of those little samskars, all of the seeds of lack of attunement, and there you are in all your <laughs> flaws and all the things that you think, well, nobody can see that. Everybody sees it. You know, there was many years ago, some of our members went to uh, Africa to uh, do uh, to different parts um, Nigeria, and they were teaching yoga and meditation in different areas there. And the, one of the men stayed there, uh, one of the Africans started a little school with our teachings. And he sent a video back of the school, and he was working with affirmations, and there were these beautiful little African children. And so they were doing these affirmations. I am beautiful, yes I am. Everybody knows it, everybody sees it. Well, when Swami comes, it's sort of the opposite, it's like, <laughs> I am pitiful. Yes, I am. Everybody knows it. Everybody sees it. But why is that? It's, Swami said, if you see a flaw in yourself, rejoice, because it's always been there. You just never saw it before. And so I would walk into the room with him, and he would say, would you like some tea? And all of a sudden, I would feel this turmoil of unresolved emotions and confusion. <laughs> but the gift this time is I be, when I sit to meditate, and the, Jyotish was alluding to this, but I, I'm taking it a little bit deeper because it's, it's really what I've been working on in this, these days since Swamiji has come. Feel in your heart, as soon as you react, feel exactly where that reaction is. It's almost like a, you know, when you, you feel a, you step on a thorn and you can feel exactly where it is in your foot, you can feel exactly where that fear or anxiety or attachment or desire or whatever it might be, you can feel exactly where it is in your heart. And then like a, like a thorn, consciously with all your Courage. Courage is what it takes to find God. Pull that out and say, okay, if I stop being anxious about this thing, what in the hell if it happens? Do you think it's my anxiety that's holding it off? Not at all. <laughs> and so tap the courage just to say, I'm not going to be afraid of that anymore, and I'm going to bring it up, and I have a fire here, and that fire is burning, and behind that fire is master, and I offer that seed of anxiety or fear or concern or self-doubt or lack of self-confidence, whatever it is, and I offer that into the fire, and as each one burns up, the smoke clears, and there's master. And so to have the courage, and that courage comes from using the energy. I am a warrior for God. And that doesn't just mean, oh, it, it just goes to the most profound level of your being. And it just, it gets in there amongst you where you think this is okay. I don't have to change that. Wherever you find yourself saying that, no, that's exactly what you have to change. Wherever you justify, wherever you defend, wherever you try to say it wasn't my fault, that's the best clue to know that's exactly what you have to work on. And then have the courage to say, Master, I don't know. I don't know what it'll be if I let go of my self-doubt. If I let, This is the whole symbolism of the Gita. 
the, the warriors against the forces of good are our own selves. And so to use the energy around us, to use the courage to say, what if it all goes? So what? I stand here firm in my faith. Somebody said something so interesting yesterday, or a few days ago. We were trying to get this piece of electrical equipment hooked up for him. Again, he's always pushing the edge. I remember uh, he, for a period of time, it was always, however he made coffee, then the next day he would be making it a different way. And so he would say, would you make me some coffee? And for a while it was frozen coffee cubes. For a while it was, it was just all, so he's always saying, you think you know how to do it, you don't know how to do it. And so we were trying to get this piece of electrical equipment hooked up for him, which was way beyond anything we knew. Luckily, I had the easy part. I just said, let's call so-and-so, let's call so-and-so. <laughs> and Jotish was trying to make it work. And it was, and it finally got to the point where there were so many wires and cords and attachments in Swami's apartment. It looked like the inside of a, of a piece of electrical equipment. But then I said to Swami, I'm sure we're going to get it work, get it to work. And he said, that means you, that, he said, that means you aren't sure. If you say, I know we're going to get it to work, but you said, I'm, and I just thought, yeah, it's really true. It's really true. And so it's not enough to say, I'm sure I'm going to find God. That implies doubt. You have to say, I know. I know with Guru's grace, I will burn up my karma in this age of Dwapara Yuga with the tools that my Guru has given me and with his grace, I can do this. And then we can be a role model for others. People can look at us and they say, if they can do it, I can do it. I remember once I was, some years ago, I was shopping in a store. It was a very nice men's store. And there was a woman in there and her son was with her. And she was a very well-dressed, intelligent-looking professional woman. Her son must have, was um, retarded and, paral and crippled and just a very deformed body. And she was buying clothes for him. And I, I just kept, my, my mind kept, my eyes just kept going to her. And she was so cheerful and she was so, she said, oh, try this on. He said, okay, that'll look good in you. And I just, I just had to go talk with her. And I said, um, it's hard to find, I just wanted to say something. I said, it's hard to find clothes, isn't it? And she said, oh yes, but we'll find something. And she was such a role model to me because there was no, no t tissue in her consciousness of self-pity, of embarrassment for her son, of remorse for her situation. She was pleased with life. And we, in these times ahead, if we can be that kind of role model where we can just say, look, I lost it all. I had it burned down. I have battle scars. I've fallen off the path. I've blown it majorly many times, but here I am, bloodied but unbowed, as Master said. So to help others to find that source of strength, and then finally, in this age of Dwapara Yuga, with our Guru's grace, to know that we can find God, to never doubt that. Don't say, I'm sure, say, I know. And to use the techniques of our path, use the energy of Dwapara Yuga. What an opportunity. And as Swami has been saying ever since we knew him, there may be, um, there may be trouble ahead. But even if there is, we walk through it and know that all of this world is simply all of our tests. As Master said, every single test we have is a test of our willpower. And I wanted just to close. This is very charming and simple. But this is a letter I was looking at that Master wrote to Swamiji. It's in the new path, my life with Paramahansa Yogananda, Swami's expanded and enhanced autobiography. And it'll be coming out, we hope, Thursday, but if not Thursday, Friday. But this is a letter that Master wrote to Swamiji in 1950 when he was at 29 Palms with him. And in a way, if we look at Swamiji's life, we can understand that this was the beginning of his mission. Master, you know, he had been there and Master had given him this to do and that to do. But then he called them out to 29 Palms, and he had him work 
editing the Gita commentaries, helping him with that. He talked to him often and daily about the future of the work and how his, what his role was. He said, you have a great work to do, so you must try very hard. And so really we need to understand that that period was the beginning of Swami's, of Master's clear empowering to Swamiji of this mission of what he has created in the world. Last night we were watching the concert and on the way home in the car with Swami, we were remembering spiritual renewal weeks decades ago when Swami was the whole concert. <laughs> he sang every song, he played every song on his guitar and now we watch him with this beautiful circle of young and old and instruments and flutes and cellos and pianos. And it was like, oh my God, what fruit this life has borne. But Master wrote him, while he was in the uh, desert, Master wrote him a number of letters. But I was reading this one recently, and it just captured for me the guru-disciple relationship, so simple, so cosmic, and yet so personal and so filled with concern. So Master writes him, meditate deeply at night and every two hours run around the hermitage for five to ten minutes. Keep exercised and body fit for God realization. Do not procrastinate or act carelessly. Hurry with discretion. And he's telling him all these things. Meditate deeply. Keep the body fit for exercise and do your energization exercises. Keep it fit for God realization. And then do your work with concentration, with attention and focus and devotion. It's his whole path laid out there. Meditate, serve. Think of me all the time. And then Master ends. Boundless blessings through myself. P. Yogananda. And then there's a little P.S. Have you butane gas? <laughs> if not, ask Miss Wright. Water the plants early morning if they need it. And I read that, and it just touched me so deeply that this avatar of our age his eye is on the sparrow. Not a sparrow falls, not a grain of sand without my sight. Remember, if you remember nothing else for this week, how much Master loves you and how much he wants you to seek God and to succeed in your quest in this lifetime.